I'm here in Medjugorjean. I'm with Father, what's your name? Miles Walsh, Father Miles Walsh. And you said you came, you are from Louisiana as well? Yes, from the Diocese of Baton Rouge in Louisiana. And you told me you came four times here, right? This was my fourth trip. When did you come the first time? Uh, the first time I came to Medjugorje was in 1989. Why did you come here? Well, I was very fortunate I, when I first heard about Medjugorje. Mm -hmm. uh, which was probably around 1985. Mm -hmm. Right away I believed it. God gave me the feeling of certainty that it was true. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, there was a, a bishop, he was an auxiliary bishop in New Orleans mm -hmm. at the time, and he had come to say Mass in the parish that I was assigned at, so this must have been about 85. And I heard him mention, actually, on the intercom, I wasn't at the Mass, I was across the street in the rectory, mm -hmm. that there were children who were receiving apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary in what at that time was communist Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. uh, his name was uh, Bishop Nick, and he was a, uh, a Franciscan who had been expelled from Central America and ended up in, in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. uh, and as soon as I heard that, for some reason, I believed it right away. And um, I began to read the messages, you know, and they, they spoke to me very deeply in my heart. And uh, we were very blessed in Baton Rouge in that one of the six visionaries of Medjugorje, Maria Pavlovich, uh, donated a kidney to her brother, Andrea. The surgery was done in Birmingham, Alabama mm -hmm. in the late 90s mm -hmm. and um, one of the physicians who befriended her at that time was a parishioner and a close friend of mine a doctor from Baton Rouge mm -hmm. and he invited her after her surgery after the donating her kidney to come and convalesce at his home in Baton Rouge and um, at that time also the Archbishop of New Orleans mm -hmm. Archbishop Philip Hannon and our own bishop in Baton Rouge, Stanley Ott, mm -hmm. were also supporters of Medjugorje in the early days and uh, believers. Mm -hmm. And so they encouraged the priests and the people to investigate it. And um, as it turns out, I was able to go uh, to the home of my friends who had welcomed Maria. Mm -hmm. and. Um, she stayed there for quite a while, convalescing, mm -hmm. and we all became very close. She came back a number of times to visit. Mm -hmm. So I was present at quite a few of her apparitions at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, again, I believed very much. And, um, but I did have the opportunity to come mm -hmm. in 1989, finally on my own. Mm -hmm. so, before coming to the point that you came to Medjugorje, a lot of people ask, how are the visionaries? What would you tell them? They ask me, uh, did, you yes. see, did you meet a visionary? Yes, yes. Well, you know, the, as I said, the visionary whom I got to know in mm -hmm. Baton Rouge and then uh, stayed with when I came here was Maria Pavlovich. I got to know the members of her family. Um, at that time, she was dating the man, mm -hmm. Paolo Linetti, who would become her husband. I got to know him and members of his family too. And um, just wonderful down to earth. Of course, the people here, Medjugorje was not westernized at all at that time. It was still under communist rule. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people were, you know, very humble people. You could tell very prayerful, holy people. And that was my, as soon as I met Maria, you know, any misgivings that I would have had were, were gone because she was such a, a humble, prayerful, and obviously holy young woman. Uh, Still who had now, I can confirm, I saw her. Yes. And so you came to Metzegoria then? Finally you so, came here? So I came here, and uh, there were things that happened to me here in that trip in 1989 mm -hmm. that uh, totally convince me if I had any doubts whatsoever. Um, well, part of our group, there were about 50 or so people in that group, and um, they're people of all ages from our area. Mm -hmm. 
one of them was a young boy. His name was Jamie. He was 11 years old, mm -hmm. and he was traveling with his mother, mm -hmm. Debbie. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a terminal brain tumor. So uh, he had been sick for a number of years, I think for about five or six years. He had mm -hmm. had the tumor. He was in a wheelchair. We had a very difficult time getting here. Mm -hmm. Um, it was still communist time, the end of the communist time. Yeah. It was, and you know, we were going on a chartered jet, which had difficulty. We, we went from New Orleans to JFK, but we ended up, ironically, spending the night that night on the floor at Air Zaire, of all places, uh, which, uh -huh. which was, um, it, it was a challenge. And among those of us who were on the traveling, and as I said, people from there, you know, from the little 11-year-old boy to we had people who were close to 80, mm -hmm. and my own parents were with me at the time. Um, it ended up taking us 48 hours, you know, uh, to get here mm -hmm. because the chartered jet had trouble and then, and then it needed to be fueled and, and so on. So I really tested, I, we had a difficult time coming. and. I remember about the third night that I was here. Um, this was before we had the cell phones and so on. For example, Maria, whom I'd met in Baton Rouge and gotten to know, had no idea that, that we were coming here, no way of knowing. Mm -hmm. And my, my real prayer, I had come to uh, know the heart of this little boy who was mm -hmm. so sick. Mm -hmm. He was a very cheerful kid, full of life, full of joy. And we wanted so badly, all of us, for him to be able to be in the apparition room mm -hmm. with, the, with the visionaries. Mm -hmm. And uh, after we got here, after all that traveling, uh, for three nights or three days in a row, he had gone to the, at that time, the apparitions were taking place in the bell tower. Mm -hmm. And his mother in would... In the bell tower? In the bell tower, uh -huh. at the church. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, so there was a door at the bottom, but each time uh, he and his mother went, she would wheel him in his wheelchair. Mm -hmm. There were just too many people and, and they were turned away. Mm -hmm. So I remember on the third night, I was walking to the church, everybody, thousands of people, thousands of people from everywhere were here. And I was walking in a big group with my fellow pilgrims, including my parents. And all of a sudden, a prayer came to me. Um, I realized later it was something the Holy Spirit put within me. And I said, Lord, if your mother's really here, um, I would like to have two things happen this week. I want this little boy, Jamie, to be admitted to the apparition room. Mm -hmm. And I said, I would like just a few minutes alone with Maria uh, to see her and talk to her. Mm -hmm. And of course, as I said, she had no idea that I was in town. I had no way of contacting her. Mm -hmm. um, and as soon as I made that intention, I mean the split second I made that intention, as hundreds and hundreds of people were walking towards the church and I was in the middle of the group, I heard a car honk. Mm -hmm. And there was a little beat up yellow car that was going against the crowd, through the crowd, away from the church. And uh, the fellow who was driving the car started saying, Father, Father. Mm -hmm. And of course there were other priests around, so we all looked. Mm -hmm. But I recognized that it was Maria's brother mm -hmm. who had received a kidney from her in the United States, Andrea. Mm -hmm. And he was waving to me and he said, you want to see Maria? So he said, get in the car. So of course I, I left the, the pilgrims who were heading to the church. I thought Maria was already at the church. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'll take you to see Maria. She was at her house. He said, we always wait until the last minute when everybody's there. Mm -hmm. And she, was, she put her head out of the, uh, the second story window mm -hmm. when I arrived at her house mm -hmm. and she said father come I have milk and cookies for you now mm -hmm. she had no way of knowing that I was there mm -hmm. but so and I went we had a, a great visit you know and then she she said 
so come with me to the church. She invited me to go to the apparition room, but I said, no, Maria, there are others who, you know, need to go. I've been with you mm -hmm. uh, many times mm -hmm. before during an apparition. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I said goodbye to her. Mm -hmm. We got out of the car together and she went up into the bell tower for the apparition. Well, later in the, uh, that night, uh, after the apparition at supper, mm -hmm. I saw the mother of the little boy and the little boy himself, Jamie, and she said she had been turned away again that day. But she said, and it was right at the time that I had made that prayer, mm -hmm. that I wanted little Jamie to go to the apparition room. Mm -hmm. She said, something made me turn around and go back, because they had gone back to their guest house when, when he couldn't get in. And she said, something made me go around and go back. Um, and as we got to the door, Yvonne, mm -hmm. one of the other visionaries, said, little boy, come with me. And Jamie got out of his wheelchair and he climbed the stairs, which she said he had barely walked for about five years. And so it, it was just those, to me, two miracles at once. Uh, and I, you know, it, it helped me to understand again just how good the Lord is. And uh, I've always said since then, you could put me on a rack, mm -hmm. but I could never ever deny the authenticity of what is happening here, that the mother of God uh, has come to visit the world in an extraordinary way. And- um, Unbelievable, and you came back over the years? I or? came back uh, the following year in 1990 with just some friends, mm -hmm. just a small group. Mm -hmm. And then the war intervened, you know. Now, I did get to see Maria a couple of more times, and also Father Slavko, they came to visit. We often had uh, speakers who would come to the New Orleans area mm -hmm. and make the rounds to Baton Rouge and Lafayette and so on. So I got to see them a couple of more times in the United States, mm -hmm. and, um, and then also in Italy. But the war mm -hmm. kind of broke my stride in coming back. Uh, so I didn't come back again until about two and a half years ago. Wow, and again, I came with friends. Later. Yeah, Is so there a it was. Lot of changes in that time? Oh, yeah, yeah. It had been almost 30 years, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, since my previous visit. Mm -hmm. And of course, when I came in the late 80s, it was just little hamlets, little villages, mm -hmm. open fields, the church. And now it's developed, I think, in a beautiful way, in a way to accommodate so many of the pilgrims who come. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, some people say, well, it's been commercialized and so on. Uh, at every place of pilgrimage I've ever been to in my life, um, you see that God in his providence has guest houses, hotels, shops, dining rooms, and so on to welcome visitors which is an absolute necessity. And, uh, but I would say that the people of Croatia mm -hmm. are just the same, you know, very stay, welcoming, faith-filled, prayerful, honest, good people. And I really think part of the, part of the experience of coming to uh, a pilgrimage in Medjugorje mm -hmm. is getting to know the Croatian people who welcome you. Yeah. The uh, kindness to down to our... Right, right. And you know, I was just talking to your priest friend. What what is for you to encourage maybe young people, somebody out there looking for a vocation, and what is the beauty for you of the priesthood, and why did you choose? Yeah. To become a priest? Well, I became a priest in 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, before the apparitions began, mm -hmm. I was a priest of one year when the apparitions began, and the first time I came here, I'd been a priest for about 10 years, mm -hmm. but it certainly uh, strengthened my priestly vocation. Mm -hmm. um, for a while in the 90s, the mid-90s, I worked at the seminary in Rome, the American Seminary, the North American College, mm -hmm. and I would always ask the seminarians at that time mm -hmm. uh, what were the major factors in their vocational discernment. And there were three things that they would always mention. Uh, one was Pope John Paul II, which was, they really looked up to him and felt uh, a call from him in a very personal way. The secondly um, was Eucharistic adoration, 
they had felt the Lord speak to them, mm -hmm. um, you know, from the Blessed Sacrament mm -hmm. um, during their time of prayer and adoration. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing was their devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. And I would say the great majority had either visited Medjugorje or had studied the messages of Medjugorje at that time and felt a call through the events that were occurring here in Medjugorje. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that it, it's through Medjugorje that a new Pentecost, I've always felt that, you know, when the Blessed Mother began to, to come, mm -hmm. of course, she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So when you find Mary, you'll also find the Holy Spirit. And um, especially in those early days, there was just an explosion of spiritual gifts here. Mm -hmm. of every kind and there were miracles and I wouldn't have to tell you what they were most people are aware rosaries turning to gold the sun dancing in the sky mm -hmm. but also the kind of internal miracles like the ones that I spoke about that happened to me mm -hmm. and deeper conversion so many people experienced conversion um, physical healings people who were sick but who accepted the fact that God was calling them home mm -hmm. um, and then you saw entire areas, for example, in my part of the United States, mm -hmm. um, in South Louisiana, for example, so many thousands of people came in those early days, and it really influenced our Catholic culture, you know. And um, the message of Medjugorje, the five stones, you know, rosary, mass, confession, fasting, and uh, Bible daily reading. Mm -hmm. um, they make perfect sense. They're intrinsic to living a Catholic life mm -hmm. and uh, you know practicing Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. So the message is, of course, any, any time a private revelation it's true, mm -hmm. it, it, it really is not novel. It doesn't add anything new, but it just reinforces and shines a spotlight on what we already know and what we already have. And what would you tell people, you know, there are a lot of people out there, I talk a lot about confession. What would you tell them if they are scared to go to confession? Maybe it's often here, maybe after 20 years they go first time yeah. to confession. What is yeah. the beauty and why not be scared from the side of the priest? Well, I, I think for the majority of people who come to Medjugorje, mm -hmm. um, I guess the, the biggest breakthrough is a good confession, mm -hmm. you know. So of those five stones, I would probably say confession and fasting, but sometimes fasting takes longer to, to practice and, and maybe to yeah, perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But confession is, is the breakthrough for so many people, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, confession is the kind of thing, I worked with a priest, many people know who he is, Father Mark Beard. Mm -hmm. Uh, who who died in, in a car accident this summer, mm -hmm. but who came to Medjugorje repeatedly and spread the message of Medjugorje mm -hmm. in a very effective way in our diocese and in our area. Many people know him through, um, you know, his his uh, homilies that were mm -hmm. live streamed over the years, and um, he would always tell people, you know, if you're hesitant about going to confession. He'd say, just go and throw it up is the term that he would use, throw it up. Uh -huh. You know, just blurt out your sins and, and trust that God is going to receive you with joy and grant you forgiveness through the ministry of a priest mm -hmm. rather than carrying that heavy burden of guilt and shame. So, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, so monthly confession again is, is nothing new in the tradition of the church, but it is certainly... Uh, reinforced by the messages of Medjugorje. But you see, a lot of people, my brother always told me, asked the question, a lot of people think that God the Father is an angry old man with a white beard, waiting, yeah. all seeing eye, looking at you, then yeah. spotting you, and I yeah. got you, now yeah. you go to hell. Yeah. But he's not like that, yeah. you have the experience of him. Yes. How would you describe God the Father? Yeah. Well, when you discover God, you're always surprised. And what you're surprised by is the unconditional nature of His love. Mm -hmm. You know, um, love isn't free because we have to accept it. 
But from God's point of view, love is unconditional. He created us. He's our Father. He redeemed us through Jesus, His Son. Uh, he's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit that none of us can ever merit, whether we're a newborn infant or somebody of mature years. Uh, that we can never merit our share in God's life. And, and so when we, when we carry around the burden of not really knowing Him in a personal way, or being afraid of Him in a negative way, fear of the Lord is good because it's the beginning of wisdom, but it has to mature into reverence and knowledge of God. And even a love affair, no? And, and he, he always surprises, He bowls us over. You know, with the knowledge of his love, uh, just as he did to Paul on the road to Damascus. You know, and in one way or another, he he does the same thing with each and every one of us. So. And how is how is it for you, Father Pio, saying that the, the Rosary is the weapon of our times? Yes. For you as a priest, yes. you pray the Rosary. Yes. yes. What uh, is your experience with that prayer? Yeah. Well, I was I was having a discussion with another priest yesterday, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I remember once when Senior Dolan, who is now Cardinal Dolan, mm -hmm. uh, at the seminary, he was the rector when I worked at the seminary in Rome, and uh, you would always see him uh, walking up and down the hallway saying his rosary, and then we'd also, of course, say the rosary um, as, a, as a corporate group. Mm -hmm. And I remember him saying or giving a conference once that he said that the rosary was his favorite form of prayer. And I think most priests would agree with that, you know, Why that, that? Uh, that once you become habituated to the rosary, mm -hmm. first of all, it's, it's very simple. It's a prayer that's been offered throughout the ages. It's a prayer that was given to us by the Holy Spirit, by the Blessed Mother herself uh, through the ministry of St. Dominic. Mm -hmm. And um, in one form or the other, though, it goes back even centuries before mm -hmm. St. Dominic. Mm -hmm. um, and in line with the 150 Psalms, we have the 150 Hail Marys of the Rosary. Mm -hmm. Something that anybody, you know, even a person who's uneducated or illiterate can make part of their life. And uh, like anything in life, uh, the more you do it, the more it becomes second nature to you. And that's what I always uh, tell people as they say they're trying to learn the rose. Sometimes, of course, people who or becoming Catholic, mm -hmm. uh, they don't eat, they don't have the devotion to the Blessed Mother, nor do they have knowledge of the Rosary, and so those seem to be very difficult things. Mm -hmm. And I always tell them when it comes to the Rosary, it's like learning to ride a bike. You know, uh, you practice. Uh, it takes a while, but it becomes. It does. It's like driving a car. It becomes second nature to you. So that. The Our Fathers and the Hail Marys, I think of as the background music mm -hmm. to your meditation mm -hmm. on the life of Jesus. So it's really an instruction on the life of Christ as given to us in the Holy Scripture mm -hmm. uh, with those two beautiful prayers, the Our Father, which is taught to us by Jesus himself, and then the Hail Mary, which is given to us by the angel Gabriel and by St. Elizabeth, so it's, it's right there in the scripture. And you, you find peace and joy, praying the oh, rosary, clarity? Very much so, very much so. And, uh, and you saw the effectiveness of the prayer in your life? That oh, were absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 couldn't think of, I couldn't think of a day without the rosary, you know. Um, and, you know, I see you have a personal relationship with Christ. You have a living God, it's called the living God of Israel and the nations. How can people have that relationship? There are a lot of people searching for that peace, you know, the serenity. You, you're, I'm listening to you, you have that serenity. Mm -hmm. How do we yeah. all look for it? Yeah. How can we have it? Yeah, yeah. Well, the first thing I think to realize is that uh, for many who are in the West, especially today, we live in a culture which is anti-God. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be aware that you're swimming in very polluted waters. You're breathing, unfortunately, very polluted air. Mm -hmm. um, people today are so concerned about the environment, about climate change and so on. Um, our alarm at our physical environment uh, 
should remind us that we're living in a spiritual environment which is even more seriously threatened and uh, that we have an enemy who's actively working mm -hmm. you know to lead us away from God mm -hmm. uh, so you do need that breakthrough the first the first thing I would say is is try to find a friend or friends among people of strong faith you know, God did not put us on earth mm -hmm. uh, to go to Him by ourselves. It, it can't be just a, a, a lone occupation, you know. And I think again of St. Paul, his conversion. Uh, when he was on the road to Damascus, he was an enemy of Christ. But yet when he had that encounter with God, he needed others to support him and he was supported and, and even during the time that he spent in darkness, during the time that he was struck blind, he was surrounded by people of faith who brought him to a man who prayed over him and those scales then fell. And uh, God will give us companions on the way. Um, sometimes just to make a, a, what I think is a simple but wise decision when you're really searching spiritually to go on a pilgrimage to a place like Medjugorje, to go to Guadalupe in Mexico, go to Lourdes in France, go to Fatima in Portugal, mm -hmm. uh, walk the Camino in Spain. You know, we're so blessed as Catholics that we have this, this tradition and the treasury of grace. And so finding a good Catholic friend, someone who has a, a, a true faith and an authentic faith, and a spirit of charity and who will welcome you in the name of Christ and then to become a companion with that person along the way and uh, you know when you're ready the spirit will tell you to to take the plunge mm -hmm. and maybe do something that might seem foolish to you or to your friends like coming to Medjugorje in, in Bosnia Herzegovina mm -hmm. and see what happens when you come here and you know that's the, another point the guidance by the holy spirit very i just read bible this morning and jesus said he was guided by the spirit into the wilderness how does this guidance function to somebody who, who wants to learn uh, to be guided by the holy spirit what would you tell them yeah yeah well as i said you you need spiritual help mm -hmm. you know uh, everyone needs spiritual direction now it doesn't mean that you're going to magically find a spiritual director or a priest mm -hmm. uh, who is a spiritual director at that beginning point. Mm -hmm. But God will provide spiritual direction uh, if someone is sincerely seeking Him. Uh, and uh, I think we can never be afraid mm -hmm. to talk to others about what's really in our hearts. You know, some people, they, they're all pent up and they don't tell anyone else what's really in their hearts. Mm -hmm. And uh, to use the old cliche, people tell me this mm -hmm. all the time in confession, I was looking for love in all the wrong places, you know? I did too. And people go down uh, paths that are not the right path. Um, but God works in mysterious ways, and as you know, He writes straight with crooked lines. So. If you, if you find a solid person mm -hmm. to talk to, as I say, a man or woman of faith, uh, God can speak very powerfully to you through that person and you begin to get the help that you need, mm -hmm. you know. And what would you tell people, you know, that's a new question, for me it's quite tough always, the fasting. What, what is so important about the fasting? What fasting, you, yeah. yes, fasting. Admittedly, mm -hmm. that's not something that's widely practiced, you know, in our culture. Uh, dieting is, but dieting is not the same thing as fasting. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people even overdo dieting and they might do it out of vanity. Uh, fasting, of course, is to uh, give up something that in itself is not bad, mm -hmm. for example, food. Mm -hmm. uh, but to do it out of hunger and thirst for God, you know. And uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm struck the more I learn about the traditions and the history of the Croatian people, mm -hmm. the simplicity of their lives, 
you know, for centuries, but even in our, closer to our own time, especially during communist rule and so on, mm -hmm. uh, they led very ascetical lives. They worked hard in the fields. They were deprived in many ways of the opportunity to uh, develop uh, professions and careers here at home. Many of the men had to go away and work. But the people who lived here, uh, they, you know, they worked out in the fields. Bread and water was what really sustained them. And there were many, many days of fasting, even by necessity. So it made, it made sense to them, you know, and uh, it wasn't foreign to them. Now, for those of us in a place like uh, the United States and Western Europe and so on, we're surrounded by an abundance, yes. uh, you know, really too much food and, uh, uh, and also processed food and so on, food that's not really good for us, but yet is very tasty and addictive. Yeah. So, I know it. Cake. <laughs> right. Yeah. Too, sugar, mu too much sugar. Too much sugar. I'm in a sugar-producing area, but there's such a thing as, as, as too much sugar in our food. And uh, so it's something that we have to learn in a different way. You know, we're not going out in the fields with a jug of water and a, and a loaf of bread to sustain us throughout the day. So we have to make a conscious decision. And again, uh, it's not by sheer human willpower. It's by the grace of the Holy Spirit. And... Uh, if you're open, God will teach you at the proper time uh, and also lead people who can teach you how to fast, you know. Uh, and what would you tell people, you know, you see it yourself, we are living in a time of huge spiritual combat in the big and in the small, in the families and personal lives. How can Catholics win that spiritual combat? What would you tell them? Yeah, well, As far as winning the spiritual combat, obviously we can't go head to head with the enemy on our own. Uh, and, um, you know, grace builds on nature. God created our human nature. Our human nature is his gift to us. Mm -hmm. uh, our decision to, accept, uh, I was reading something the other day in uh, the book that Mariana wrote, mm -hmm. uh, The Heart, My Heart Will Triumph. My Heart Will Triumph. Mm -hmm. Mariana and and uh, she said something that's very true and wise, mm -hmm. you know, that free will is God's gift to us. Uh, the decision to accept God's will is our choice. It's our gift to God, you know, so The Lord offers us the grace. He's done it through our own human nature. He's done it through the gift of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. sanctifying grace. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is why, too, Catholicism, uh, of course, is, is a 2,000 year tradition that goes back to our Lord Jesus himself. But even before that, it came from uh, our Jewish roots. and. Uh, You know, people today, uh, it's, it's, it's again almost a cliche to say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a fallacy, you know. Of course we're spiritual, we're body and spirit, mm -hmm. we're body and soul. All of us are spiritual in that sense. Mm -hmm. But as the Apostle John says in his writings, we have to discern the spirit. Are we following the spirit of God or the spirit of the world? And so, Our tradition gives us the seven sacraments, which are absolutely necessary. These are the ordinary means of communicating God's grace. And I'm speaking here about sacramental grace, not only actual grace. Actual grace God can give us, you know, even we're, when we're spiritually dead, when we're in the state of mortal sin. But by definition, to receive sanctifying grace, We have to be ready to accept God's forgiveness and accept the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit and, and to nourish that life of faith and to keep it strong and to develop. Each of the sacraments is a step along the way. And so we have uh, the sacraments of initiation, 
They initiate us, baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, that initiate us into the life of grace. Uh, But the other sacraments, you know, we also have the sacraments of healing, which are confession and an earning of the sick. And we have the sacraments of vocation, which would be priesthood and marriage. All of these are ways that lead us to God. And um, you saw it in your when you received the sacrament of priest, would you saw a change, a protection, a step? Could you describe it like that? Yes, yes. In, in other words, in each sacrament gives a specific grace. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you know, felt it in your life, or you saw it in your life? Oh, life definitely, it? yes. Mm-hmm. And I, I think in any priest uh, worth his salt would say the same thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what would you tell people? We are human, we are in a fallen state. And people struggle all their lives with the shortcoming. And we Catholics, I, I talk from the heart, we want to be holy, mm-hmm. we want to be mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. Well, How do we accept the shortcomings or how do we deal with yeah. our shortcomings? Yeah. I always like to remind people, and especially if they haven't been to confession in a while, mm-hmm. and they come once. Now some people will make the mistake and say, "Well, now I've been. I don't gone. have to. I don't have to come back. You know, I, I hadn't gone in 30 years. Now I've been. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe now I'll go 30 years from now." But uh, I always remind people that among the seven sacraments, most are received very rarely, if at all. For example, most Christians will never receive the sacrament of priestly ordination. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, there are many people. For example, myself, I've never experienced the sacrament of marriage, Mm -hmm. even though I'm called as a a priest to be the bridegroom of the church. Mm -hmm. Uh, So marriage is a very important sacrament that speaks to all of us about our nuptial union with God. Uh, But there are two sacraments Mm -hmm. of the seven Mm -hmm. that are given to us for the daily walk Mm -hmm. with Christ, Mm -hmm. and that is Eucharist and reconciliation, mass, and confession. Mm -hmm. And the the thing about God gave us two legs, you know, and it's if you try to walk on one leg, you're going to fall, right? You're going to hop along, but then you'll fall. And this is what a lot of Catholics, the mistake they make, they, they say, well, I'll go to mass, but then they stop going to confession. And so... Uh, they may be receiving our Lord mm-hmm. in a profane way and when they go to communion because their souls are not prepared uh, or, and what will happen is they'll just stop going to mass yeah. you know uh, they'll feel that that interior guilt and they'll just stop going because they don't want to deal with it yeah. and yet the Lord has given us a way to deal with it which is in the sacrament confession. of reconciliation of confession you know, so, so if we put mass and confession together, mm-hmm. they work perfectly. The two strong legs, and they carry us through to the day of our death. You know, so I would say that's that's the mistake. You know, mm-hmm. uh, many people make. They wanna they wanna come up, and that's what I meant when I said people say, "Well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious." You know, religion comes from the same word as ligament. It, it joins bone to marrow and, uh, uh, you know, to bones and muscles. In other words, it, it knits us together. It comes from the word to, to, to unite, yeah. you know, so it unites our body and our soul. We're not pure spirits. Absolutely. And uh, when we pretend that we can live like angels and just have spirituality and not have religion, You know, religion puts meat on our bones, so to speak, you know. And um, what is for you as a priest, the Eucharist? Well, the Eucharist, of course, is, as Vatican II said, the source and summit Mm -hmm. of our life as as Catholics. But I would put the accent on the summit, you know. Uh, The old saying is, baptism is the most necessary sacrament because it's the gateway to salvation. It's the beginning of all other, uh, you know, means of grace. But the Eucharist is the greatest because it is the real presence of Jesus who is present in his people gathered in the Holy Word of Scripture and above all, 
his real presence in the sacrament of his body and blood. Uh, but because it is a summit, it's like climbing the hill over here. Mm -hmm. You need steps along the way. And uh, this is why we need, like, for example, daily rosary, the devotional life, devotion, for example, to uh, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, we have devotions like the Divine Mercy, which is, again, a flourishing of our Lord's uh, Sacred Heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, these are the ways that, that we climb the steps to the Eucharist. And unfortunately, as, as the devotional life decreased in importance in the catechesis that was given after Vatican II, mm -hmm. and all emphasis was placed on the Eucharist, and you know, there was mass at the drop of a hat all the time, mm -hmm. and yet people were not practicing the steps that led to the Eucharist. Well, then you begin to take our Lord in the Eucharist for granted, you know, and uh, so, True. you know, uh, John Paul wrote so beautifully about the importance, for example, of adoration, mm -hmm. you know, in his final encyclical. And, and he said that, you know, after you enjoy a good meal with friends, you don't just get up from the table the second you're finished. You, mm -hmm. you stay and you, and you visit with friends. And, and he used that as an image for Eucharistic adoration, that we come uh, to be in the Lord's presence even when we're not there for Mass. You know, when I was growing up, uh, we were always encouraged, I was trained by very good nuns, uh, to make visits to the Blessed Sacrament. And now we're blessed in the Church to have so many chapels that are specifically chapels of adoration where people can go and be in the presence even of the exposed Blessed Sacrament. And those are, those are places of, of peace and prayer, and you can feel it as soon as you walk in, yes. you know. A lot of people say that even from different religions, right. they go to a Catholic church and say there is oh, something. Yeah. In fact, that's probably, you know, in my years of working with catechumens, mm -hmm. Uh, probably the comment that I've had most often by people who become Catholic as adults who come from other religious traditions and they will tell me over and over when I walked into a Catholic church I felt something that I'd not experienced before and uh, you know sometimes that plants a seed at a point in their lives and later on they begin to experience a, a real call to become Catholic because they go further, they investigate, well, what is that that I experience when I walk into a Catholic church, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I heard a talk recently by a, a wonderful woman. Mm -hmm. Her name is um, Nikki Kingsley, and she has written a book about her life. And uh, she was a Muslim, a devout Muslim, who eventually became a Catholic. And uh, one of the things that she noticed, she had fallen in love, she says, in the, in the course of her journey with Mary, because the Quran has an entire chapter devoted to Mary. To, to Mary. Yes. Yeah. So as a woman, she was in a troubled marriage, mm -hmm. and she was looking for consolation from God as she knew Him, Allah. Mm -hmm. And uh, but she fell in love with with Mary. Mm -hmm. And um, as the years went by and she didn't know what to do with this attraction she was feeling to Christianity and to the Mary son, Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and how to process the claim that he was the son of God, because for a Muslim this is, this is blasphemy yeah. to say that God has a son yeah. or that we can know him yeah. in a very personal way. Um, she was told by a friend, again, a good friend, that she should visit a church. And uh, so she finally worked up the courage to go, but she went to the church, near, the church nearest to her home, which was not a Catholic church. She went to a Christmas service, and she said it was 
from a human point of view, a very beautiful experience. I mean, the hymns were beautiful. Everyone was given a lighted candle. The people were very warm and loving and accepting. But she could tell that the Lord Jesus, as she had come to know him uh, through his outreach to her mm -hmm. as an answer to her prayer, she could tell that he was not there in the way that she had experienced him in prayer. And when she went back to a friend and said, I'll never do this again because I, I did not experience the presence of Jesus at church. The friend said, well, what church did you go to? And when she told her it was not a Catholic church, she said, well, no, you have to go to a Catholic church. And the very first time she entered a Catholic church, immediately she felt that overpowering experience of Jesus' true presence. And at first she didn't know what it was. She didn't know that the Blessed Sacrament was the source or that the Blessed Sacrament was reserved. But over time she came to understand why she felt mm -hmm. that, that presence in a Catholic church. So, and she became Catholic. And she did become Catholic. And uh, she has a beautiful soul and she tells her story, mm -hmm. you know, when she speaks and writes. So these are the kind of very, I think, compelling witnesses that um, there's so many people in our culture who take uh, our Christian tradition for granted, you know, uh, in Western Europe and in North America, South America, and so on. Uh, you know, we are blessed to have come out of a Christian culture, a foundation that that is really the foundation is, is uh, Christianity itself. Mm -hmm. And yet, again, we live in a time that has rejected God and rejected especially the God of the Bible, the God of Jesus Christ. Why do you think that is the case? Of course, the rejection of God, it goes back centuries mm -hmm. and then the, the, the the reason is, is just the same um, that we see in the story of the Garden of Eden. You know, it's uh, the failure to, recommend, to, to accept the fact that we are creatures of God who is our creator. And then we want, you know, what was the temptation of Adam and Eve was to become like God themselves. That was the deception, that was the lie of Satan. If you eat this forbidden fruit, the fruit of which God has forbidden you to eat, God knows you will become like Him. And of course, just, just the contrary. Uh, God never willed that our first parents would know sin, that they would know evil. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so they did experience, uh, uh, you know, the Lord had warned them if they ate of that fruit, they would die. And, you know, some people would object and say, well, they ate of the fruit, they didn't drop dead. No, they didn't drop dead at that moment, but death, in, death was born in them. It yes. began, Spiritually. and, that, and that, that split between body and soul, which is really the source of death. You know, what, what happens at the moment of death is that mm -hmm. our, our soul is sundered from our bodies, and mm -hmm. so the body is no longer truly a living body. It becomes a corpse. And also and, he said, think. And we, sometimes we can't think the problem out. We have to give it over, to hand it over. As God says, be still, I am God, I fight for you. Right, right, He brings right. it back in the Psalms. You know? Right, right. And can you explain, for example, we have the devotion, you talked about the devotions, the steps. Mm -hmm. You have like a devotion to the Sacred Heart. Why? What is so important about that? Right, what, what, right. Because, in, you know, we experience our deepest emotions mm -hmm. in our heart, mm -hmm. you know. Um, for example, any adult mm -hmm. of a certain age, but even children, begin to experience heartbreak, heartache, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, very often, of course, it's through heartbreak mm -hmm. of one kind or another that we can either be open to God and turn towards Him, or that we can become bitter and angry and turn away from Him. Mm -hmm. in a more definitive way. And so, you know, when our Lord uh, appeared to St. Margaret Mary, it's, it wasn't the first time he had revealed his sacred heart. You know, mm -hmm. for example, we have in the scriptures the, the story of 
uh, the beloved disciple St. John at the Last Supper leaning against the heart of Jesus. And uh, he, he would have felt the heart of Jesus beating. Uh, and even before that, you know, I often think about Mary when our Lord was in her womb and she could feel the pulse, you know, within her own womb. And then when he was born, how often does a mother lean her head against the breast of her child just to feel the heart of her child beating? So Mary experienced his sacred heart. Mm -hmm. And then in the course of history, the great saints, you know, I think about uh, St. Gertrude, for example, Gertrude the Great in, in the uh, 13th century, you know, and uh, Gertrude once had an experience, it was on the feast of the Apostle John, mm -hmm. uh, which is right after Christmas on December 27th, and, uh, you know, in, in that experience the Lord appeared to her and he showed her his heart and he invited her to lean against his sacred heart and she said she was filled with the knowledge of the mysteries, the secrets of his sacred heart. But she also saw John present uh, during that experience and, and she said to the Apostle John, mm -hmm. why didn't you write in greater depth in your own gospel since you leaned against the heart of Jesus at the Last Supper? Mm -hmm. And he said, this is this is something that is to be revealed, the secrets of his sacred heart, at a time when the world will have rejected the love of God and, go, and grown cold and hostile mm -hmm. towards Christ himself. And so when our Lord appeared to St. Margaret Mary in the 1670s, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, this was this, already the state of the Western world, turning away from God, you know. On the one hand, you had the Jansenist heresy, which is the Catholic form of the Protestant revolt. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, you had the skeptics, the philosophers, you know, the who who, who professed a kind of deism, mm -hmm. which says that God is some kind of a higher power, but we can't really know him. So it was really a rejection mm -hmm. of Judeo-Christian tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, it, wasn't, it was not the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. It was simply a step towards atheism. You know, deism is just dressed up atheism. Always yeah. dressed up in a different, you cut right. off one head as well right. as another head. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Do you make the same experience we have Luisa Picaretta who says the divine will, we have to live what, what is written in our Father, thy will be done and then we will be in peace and in joy and if we try to do it on our own, our ego that we end up confused, not happy. Yeah. We make the same experience. Yeah. This is spiritual mathematics. I think we have to, we have to acknowledge that uh, we are in a state of fallen human nature. In other words, even though mm -hmm. Uh, through baptism, mm -hmm. original sin is remitted, we still retain the state of concupiscence, which is a wound, mm -hmm. and it's a proneness towards sin. Mm -hmm. And this is a wound that we will carry throughout our mortal lives. Now, of course, we can be strengthened, uh, you know, if a person is born with a, you know, a, a bad, I have a bad ankle, you know, so I kind of have a, a, something of a limp, Mm -hmm. But you compensate for it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with, with God's help. And with the help of God's grace, we can compensate uh, the effect of, of concupiscence and we begin to be perfected mm -hmm. in the spiritual life. Um, so, what was your question originally? That's already beautiful. That means, like, you believe that, like, on Saint Paul says, we start as spiritual babies and we grow step by right. step. Right. Right. Yeah. Is that happening? And yes. And, yes. And you also see that when you pray, "Thy will be done," you are more peace oh, and more happy. That, yeah, that's right. The divine will. So then, I, I think again to, to 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 say that we have to acknowledge mm -hmm. that. God's will is greater than ours. We have to get to the point where I'm, it, this happened to me once. Mm -hmm. I had bought, and this was after I had gone to Medjugorje, mm -hmm. um, I had bought a brand new car. Mm -hmm. And this was my second day driving this car. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was rather late at night. And I heard something, I was 
grappling with the decision, something that was going to become clearer to me in, in the weeks and the months to come. And as, as I was driving that second night in this brand new car, I heard something drop from the visor in the passenger seat and I was by myself. So I actually, it surprised me. I stopped the car, I pulled off, mm -hmm. and I found a laminated holy card. Mm -hmm. And it was from Medjugorje. So there's no way that it was there. You know, I had just gotten it from the dealer. And on the back of the card, there's, there's an image of the Blessed Mother. And it said, help me to accept your will, which is greater than my own. And actually, I found great consolation. And simply, it was telling me to acknowledge that very often what I want in life is so imperfect and it's so different than what God wants. You know, we can rationalize all kind of things. And uh, it's not that God doesn't honor our freedom. He does. But I, I would liken it in this way, if, if you're the father of a family, and use the scriptural image of a man who had two sons. Um, you know, in one case, your son comes to you and, and, and asks for advice about, let's say, a career path. And, you know, uh, he might say, you know, Dad, I can't decide if I want to be, you know, an attorney or a contractor. And his father says, I'll support you in either you know, career, uh, because I know you're capable of both. And, and another son comes with, you know, a very different uh, so-called, you know, path in life. Uh, and the father, knowing that son, knows that one is not right for him. So he says, son, you, you know, you need, you need to become a, a banker or a doctor, whatever it is because the other path is not for you. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, this is how God is as a father. He warns us of making the wrong choice when, you know. And yes, so, I saw it and, he, and, had, he put boundaries. Right, right. He so sometimes boundaries. we simply have to admit that God is far more wise. He's all-knowing, all-loving, and we aren't. And then many of the choices that we make are just plain sinful. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to lead us to spiritual death. You know? And what would you tell people? It just came to my mind, you know, I'm a soccer fan and the president of my team, 43 years old, last week on Tuesday, he didn't wake up, he died. Mm. The daughter, three years old, mm -hmm. the, 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 the wife. Mm -hmm. I think that ha you saw that in your parents. Yes. What, give you, yes. what do you give? Like if there's destiny puts that in on the yes. way, what do you give as an advice, as consolation? Yes. What would you yes. tell them? Well, as you said, in, in our parish, you know, the people had had Father Mark Beard as a pastor for, for 12 years. And uh, he died on August the 2nd. It was the Feast of Our Lady of the Angels, very significant day. And uh, I saw him probably five minutes before he was in the wreck. He was at our retreat center and he was giving a talk mm -hmm. over his lunch hour to a group of high school girls who were on retreat. And um, he left and got in his car, and within five minutes, you know, he, he was gone. And it was, of course, it was very, very hard for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, his, his mother, with whom he lived, of course, lost her beloved son. But so many people in the parish and who visited the retreat center loved him and really loved him with all their hearts. It was hard for a lot of people. A lot of people are still grieving. Some people have confided to me that they became very upset with God. Yeah, you know, why did God? Reaction. Why did God permit this to happen? And yet, uh, I firmly believe that uh, we will all die. We will die at the time that the Lord has appointed, even if it's an accidental death. Mm -hmm. You know, God knows that from the day that we're born that this is the allotted number of years that we have. And just as through the death of Jesus, mm -hmm. untold good and treasures came about. 
So through the death of any holy person who's united to Christ, many graces will come. You know, and, and I have seen that in the months since his death, mm -hmm. is the spiritual graces that have been given uh, through his holy life, through his ministry, and also through his death. And uh, I guess the, you know, the longer we go through life and the more that we meet uh, the loss of our own loved ones, mm -hmm. we begin to understand that that death is not the end. It's, it's a veil, so to speak, mm -hmm. and there's a very thin veil that separates this world from the next. And as we grow in faith, we begin to experience also our communion mm -hmm. with God's holy ones, whether you're speaking about the souls in purgatory, mm -hmm. or the souls who behold the face of God in heaven. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, ironically, this can become even a source of joy. As our close, you know, and of course, I'm, my next birthday, I'll be 70. Mm -hmm. um, are probably no more people in the graveyard <laughs> than yeah, that's not. It's happening, no? The older I get, know? I see it too, people going, yeah? Yeah. yeah. And <clears throat> can you explain the effect what I learned here in Medjugorje, Gregorian Masses? We forgot that tradition mm -hmm. to do these Masses for our mm -hmm. beloved one who, who passed on. That, right. How would you explain the power yeah. of this? Yeah. Or even masses Third. for the, the, the living ones. I think it's nine in a row. We, we lost this tradition. Yeah. It's so powerful. Yeah. Can you explain a bit what yeah. that means? And what is the great Well, word? of course, the, the greatest prayer mm -hmm. that can be offered for someone who has died mm -hmm. is the sacrifice of the mass. Mm -hmm. You know, the other day, we, our group was at a, a, a talk that was given by Father Leon, mm -hmm. who uh, is in charge of the English mass on a daily basis here, a very beautiful Dominican priest. Amen. And, uh, you know, he, he threw a question out. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, all of you are here because Medjugorje is the place where six young people uh, received apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. And he was given this talk right after we had had our Mass mm -hmm. at 10 a.m. And he said, now, would you rather be a party to an apparition, in other words, to see the Blessed Virgin Mary in an apparition, or to be present at the Mass you just celebrated and to have received Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, when you think about it that way, the answer is very clear. Yeah. You know, the whole reason that Mary came, the whole reason that she continues to come, is to lead us to her Son. So every celebration of the Mass is really the, well, of course, it's the supreme act of the worship of God here on earth. And, you know, again, this is a problem in our culture that we keep trying to invent ways to worship God. And God has given us the greatest way. This is, throughout my life as a priest, people have often said or asked me the question, Father, why is it as Catholics that on Sunday we only have the Mass? Why don't we have the Bible study, you know, like some churches have? Or why don't we have like a song fest or, you know, prayer of praise and so on? Like, and I'll, make our churches do. Yeah, like, yeah, kind of make it up as we go, you know, let's be spontaneous and so on. And why don't we have a band? you know, like some churches have, and we have a testimony and a witness on Sunday. And I always tell them, you know, we have six days of the week to do this, and there are opportunities to do this on all six days of the week. But on God's day, He has told us how we are to worship Him. And it's in the Eucharist, you know, and at the parallel, the prefigurement, is there in the Old Testament. God was very clear to Moses. Mm -hmm about how God was to be worshiped. And whenever the people of Israel veered away from that, mm -hmm. God showed his displeasure, you know? I mean, the Pharaoh, remember he told Moses, well, go out in the desert and do what you want, but Moses says, we've got to take our livestock with us because it's only there that he's gonna tell us how to sacrifice and what to sacrifice. And, uh, you know, and the, and the Pharaoh said, well, no, you can't go, you're not gonna come back if you take your livestock with you. And, and Moses says, we can't take our livestock, we're not going, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so God was very explicit and very clear. 
and he's he's clear that the supreme act of worship and of course the reason is very simple this is Jesus' self-offering you know Jesus is acting through his ordained priest mm -hmm. but as Christ you know when the when when the priest says this is my body this is my blood he doesn't speak in the third person and say this is Jesus's body this is Jesus's blood he says it's my because Jesus is acting through him Christ is offering himself eternally to God the Father and in every mass <coughs> this this eternal sacrifice is represented and that has an effect for the for the, entire for the world. salvation of the entire world, and certainly uh, for souls in purgatory. Mm -hmm. And so, there's no better way than to offer our prayer for the souls in purgatory than through, you know, offering masses for them. And uh, I was I heard, I heard a testimony from a, from a lady, actually, a lady from our area in Louisiana, who was given a vision of heaven, hell, and purgatory. And she mentioned that when she visited purgatory, uh, she saw a great uncle of hers who was a, related by marriage, not by blood. And he was from a non-Catholic family. He had actually been, I think, seriously wounded in the First World War, kind of shell shock. And he ended up taking his life. And she saw him in a very uh, low place in purgatory, and but because they were related, there, they, they, there was a, a kinship that they both recognized. And she realized that because he was from a non-Catholic family, uh, no one had really prayed for him. So after that experience, she and her mother began to pray and have masses offered for him. And she was later given the knowledge, you know, that he had entered heaven. And uh, so this is another thing, you know, that about our Catholic faith that we can only rejoice in but never forget is the importance of praying for the souls of those who have died. They're really, they're in a, they're in a position where they can no longer earn merit. Mm -hmm. And God has given to those of us who are on earth a special mission, which is to pray for the souls in purgatory, you know. Wow, and wow. Uh, yeah. yeah, especially for those who perhaps weren't Catholic and, and didn't have relatives to pray for them. Yes, you know. that's what Our Lady says in Fatima, pray for the people nobody prays for. Right, them. right, right. And right. at the end, this is so beautiful, this interview, but we have to come to an end. I hope mm -hmm. we can do one, one uh, another time. What would you tell people, why come to Medjugorje? Yeah, yeah. Well. I would say come to Medjugorje because uh, it's it's a place where uh, this spiritual explosion mm -hmm. that I talk about that's that started in 19 and I likened it to the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's still happening here. In other words, God is giving so many actual graces mm -hmm. to the pilgrims who come here. You know, God always. He enlists us in making a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. He's got something prepared for us, but he doesn't, he wants us to make a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And uh, the effort to come here to make a step in faith. And, and I would say too, if, if Medjugorje is new to you, um, learn and study Fatima, because as, as Pope Benedict mm -hmm. the 16th, said, this is when he was, before he became Pope in the year 2000, um, he wrote a document, a report on Fatima, and he said that Fatima is the most prophetic of all Marian apparitions. And it's sort of an umbrella that encompasses all the other apparitions of the modern age. And the reason is Fatima is very clearly, can be clearly defined, six apparitions, mm -hmm three messages. Uh, those messages are very prophetic and as I said they really encompass all the others. So if you studied the three messages of Fatima, mm -hmm. which is the existence of hell, mm -hmm. the great lie mm -hmm. of Marxism, mm -hmm. the rejection of God, mm -hmm. and then also the persecution of those who are authentically Christian. Mm 
in the world today. And that will come from outside the church, but also from within the church, because there are enemies within the church too. So those are the three messages of Fatima. They help you to understand why the Lord has emphasized so much those five smooth stones of Medjugorje, you know, that begin with the rosary and uh, lead up to the Eucharist. And talking about Fatima, you see it in your parish. It's also said that Sister Lu Lucia said that the end fight is for the family. Right. And we see it so many, I saw it in my family, right. friends, the right. divorce, and it's so right. tough on them. Right. What do you give families that advice to yeah. get through that yeah. marriage? Yeah. No, that, that's, that's very, very uh, important what you just mentioned that, you know, Sister Lucia. That she said this in her own old age. She wrote it to Cardinal Cafara. Mm -hmm. He had uh, been the founder of the John Paul II Institute on Marriage and Family. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the early 80s, right when the uh, institute was being founded, he wrote to her simply to ask prayers mm -hmm. for the success of this effort, which had been called for by the Synod of Bishops of 1980. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, she said that. Father, if you do this, he just asked for prayers. He didn't ask for an answer, but he got a lengthy answer from her mm -hmm. two weeks later. And she wrote back to say that if you do this work, you will meet great opposition because the decisive battle is in the area of marriage and family. And so, you know, we, we, we see this again in our, in our culture today, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the redefinition of marriage, um, which again, is we have to accept God's definition. Yes. And know. it's for the good. People don't yeah. understand. It's for the good of our soul, yeah. for our happiness. Right. right. And there was a last question popping up, you know, there is the, the Divine Mercy Chaplet. What is so powerful about that one? Why should we keep that devotion? The Divine Mercy Chaplet, well, in the Sacred Heart, devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, mm -hmm. the accent is to know the love of Christ, but to offer reparation. Mm -hmm. With Divine Mercy is really a continuation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, in, in terms of history, it goes back to the time of St. Faustina, which is in our time. You know, St. Faustina died in 1938, mm -hmm. um, right on the cusp or the eve of the Second World War. And um, if, if the, the emphasis on the love of Christ, which comes from the heart of Christ, is the same in both the Sacred Heart and, and the Divine Mercy. But whereas the emphasis in the Sacred Heart devotion is on our joining Jesus and making reparation for the sin of the world, mm -hmm. in the Divine Mercy, the emphasis is on the mercy that God pours out mm -hmm. upon us through His Sacred Heart, mm -hmm. you know. and. Uh, Mercy, St. Thomas Aquinas and many of the saints have said is God's greatest attribute in this sense. Mercy, the mercy of God only exists for our sake. You know, before we were created, God in himself is a communion of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we as human beings who fell and became sinners can only be saved by the mercy of God. You know, so within himself, God has no need of mercy. His, his relation with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is always just. There's no need for mercy, there's no sin. Mm -hmm. But in creating us, God created us free mm -hmm. with the possibility of sinning, but also repenting. So in that way, we're different than the angels. Yes. The angels, their choice was uh, an absolute the, one, stay right? In the rebellion, right? Because they were far more perfect than us, closer to God in their being, you know. But uh, personally, I've always been glad to be a human being, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that I have the chance to repent and to receive the mercy of God. And can you say, because I made that ex experience now recently here in Medjugorje, what what the Bible says in your weakness. I'm yes. and, and the, my graces are much more abundant. Right. We should right. dis dis despair. We should 
I think that we can end with that interview. Never despair. Go to confession again. Right. Like a friend or right. rabbi said, that the devil is not interested in the sin. He's in, interested in the feeling afterwards that we exactly. are lonely and we don't want to go to confession. Yeah. And keep on going. Public. Right, right, right. And when he tempts you to sin, he'll tell you, oh, it's not so bad. God won't mind. You know, this Do isn't a good sin. To you. you know. Yeah. And then once you fall, he'll say, oh, my goodness, you're disgusting. You know, you're, you're a sinner. You're beyond hope. Uh, God can never accept you, you know. Um, you're that's you're hopeless. Lie. Yeah, that's the lie. That's the lie because yeah. you experience it through the praise, the, the love, the mercy is much, much, much bigger. Right, right, right. Thank you Good. so much. Wonderful. For, for that beautiful interview, brother. Good. And the lights go on. <laughs> Good.